Uh, good to see some old friends too. Uh, it's, it's lovely to be here. Nice that me and Will were colour coordinated today. Um, we did think about letting him speak and me play, but uh, we decided that maybe wouldn't be good. It's good to be uh, thankful, isn't it? I, I, this is a lovely time of Thanksgiving, and I hope you're a thankful person. You know, I think one of the biggest things, uh, or the biggest offence we can make, is when someone does loads for us, whether it be in your family or wherever, and we're just thankless. But when you think about God and all the things he's given us, I mean, we're thinking about the food provision. I know we may not all be involved in farming or anything like that, but the food we get every day... And yet to take it all for granted, all the good gifts, is a very big thing. So have a think about that. Now we've got some uh, well-known traditional harvest uh, hymns. And we're going to start by Come Ye Thankful People, Come. Thank you, Will. Have a seat, please. Great, thank you. We've got four lovely harvest hymns, and then the children are going to sing. Is that right? You ready to go? Not quite, quite yet, but I know you're all excited. But we're going to have that in a moment. In a moment. We're going to pray, sing a hymn together, and then it will be your turn. Okay? So just pray with me and ask God to be with us here. Uh, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be here together giving thanks to you, almighty God, who is the giver of all good gifts. And Father, today we want to recognise that you are the Father of lights from whom all good gifts proceed. We thank you for family, we thank you for life, we thank you for health. So many, many things we have every day, which often, Lord, we take for granted. And Father, we thank you for food. Every day we eat, and in this country we eat well, and we praise and thank you for all your provision. 
And today, Lord, we want to particularly concentrate on your provision of food, and we thank you for it. Father, that again we've had a harvest and the crops mainly have come in, and we thank you for that. And we thank you as we look forward now to uh, food every day, Lord, uh, freely given by you. And so we thank you for daily provision. Help us to be thankful people. As Colin prayed, we thank you for the gift of your son, the Lord Jesus, who came into the world to be the saviour. And Father, we can be so thankless regarding him who came and lived and died for us. Father, for all of us here, I pray that you'd work in our hearts today and by the end of this service we might be giving thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ, the saviour of the world. May we be worshipping him at the end of this time, I pray. I pray that your Holy Spirit be at work as we read your word, as we talk about your word and apply it to our lives and open our hearts, open our eyes to see great things in, in your word and to see the Lord Jesus for who he is. Father, work in us, all of us. Convict us of our sin and show us the Saviour today, we pray. So be merciful to us, help us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. So we are going to sing our second harvest hymn, and then at the end of this, children, it's over to you. So let's all stand and sing our second harvest hymn, please. <laughs> See, I told you I should have played. <laughs> I knew, I knew. Okay. That's the one, you see. Let's stand and see. We see the fruitful harvest Our gracious God provides And how in his
Right. quickly about um, this is from the book of Luke Jesus told a parable will this pick me up if I come to here will there okay Jesus told a parable okay about a farmer who sowed his seed okay here he is I don't know if that's a typical farmer um, actually looks a bit like you John I think okay with a beard um, possibly I think you're the only one with a beard here oh no there's you as well but I know John on you in farming, all of you as a family. Now look, what is he growing is the question. What's he growing, you guys? That, just a second, that was for the children. <laughs> that was a children's question. <laughs> Give them a chance. Give them a chance. Children, what's he growing? A corridor. Corn or maize, yeah. These are even harder questions. So what sort of seed do you think he puts in? <coughs> what sort of seeds he put in? He wants to grow corn. I mean, he's growing pretty rapidly. Doesn't look. But what sort of seeds he put in? It's an important question. You can have a go. Corn seed. Okay. Anyway, he does exactly as you say. Okay. And it is a bumper harvest. Just look at that. There's loads of this grown out here now, isn't there? But they don't let it get that far, do they? They make it into silage, don't they? And it's a bumper harvest, look. And when he comes to harvest it, he has that much, look. He does not know where to put it all, okay? Am I too, can you see all right? I'm not too far away. Okay. In fact, his little barn, which he has, he realises there's a problem. What's the problem with the, the little barn? Magic. So it's such a bumper harvest, and he cannot get all his corn into the barn. So he hatches a plan, and he decides, with great delight, here's what I'll do. It's a light bulb moment look there. Okay? He, he draws up some plans to make bigger barns. Can you see that there's a blueprint? Can you all see them? And he gets the word. And he, he's happy because he thinks, next year I won't waste any corn. Because this year, he had that much, sun was outside the barn. And I think what was going on in his mind, he had all that in the barn, but those few bits of corn outside the barn that got wasted, he couldn't get in. He worried about them a lot, even though he had so much. How strange that is. Anyway, so he gets his tin back, and he builds one like Bigger and better. And he thinks, this year, we won't have any wasted. But as you can see, he planted again. He grew his corn. Oh, what sort of seed did he plant to get his corn? The corridor? Corn seed to get corn. Good, okay. 
He harvested the massive harvest, even bigger than last year. But he still has a problem. Can you see the problem he has? What's the problem? It's still not big enough. And although the barn was full of corn, even more than last year, he worried so much about that, those three baskets that got wasted outside, even though we had so much. Do you think we're a little bit like that? We are human nature. We can have so much, and we fret and worry about a few little bits that we can't keep for ourselves. Isn't that strange? That's human nature. We'll talk about the one in a minute. So he, you, know, you know what he does, don't you? He thinks, I am going to build a bigger bar. Okay? This time, it's grand. The harvest was massive. He didn't only plant corn. What else do you think he planted? Corridor. <coughs> Potatoes. Not in this picture, I'm sorry. It does grow underground, there's some on the table. Madge? Uh, two guesses. Uh, uh, only one? <laughs> I'm the chairman here. Okay, only one. What's it going? Carrots. Carrots, you're correct. So he built this bigger barn. Massive harvest, filled it up, but still some waste. So last attempt, he is going to build the most humongous barn. Just look at that. I mean, honestly, I think I'd live in it, wouldn't you? It's, it's fantastic. Okay, look, he builds this whopping great barn, okay, and then God speaks to him. I'm going to read to you what God says, because I don't want you to... I'm sort of dressing that story up a little bit, okay? But let me just read to you what God said to him when Jesus told this story, okay? I'm going to read it to you. Here we are, Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 21, and this is what he says, okay? He built this massive barn, and he thought, I'll better store so much, I'll better take my ease and have enough forever. This is what he said. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink and be merry. But, I said God spoke. But God said to him, fool, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you've prepared Whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Now look, in my pictures, okay, he built that, a massive barn. He thought, I'm going to take my ease. I've got a retirement plan. I'll have that much food forevermore. And it, if you read the story, it's all about me, my, mine. That's the only interest he had. I'm going to sort myself out. No thought about anyone else. Or say thank you to God, like we've said. And God spoke to him. It wasn't the question, who's going to have all the things you've stored up? Well, they all went elsewhere. Let's learn something from that. We'll talk about it again in a moment, okay? Now, I'm going to read from the Bible. And we're going to read from Matthew chapter 7. I think it was going on the screen. Thank you, Colin. And verses 13 to 29. Okay. And there's, in this, in the, what we're going to read, there's three sets of pairs. Okay. You'll see um, two ways to live, two trees that bear fruit, and two houses built on two foundations. So we'll start at verse 13. Okay. This is Jesus speaking. Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. 
and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll recognise them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognise them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine, and does not do them, will be like a foolish man, who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. I want to talk about that in a moment, just briefly. But we're going to sing again, and another very well-known hymn. We plough the fields and scatter. I know in this day and age, there's not quite so much ploughing going on as there used to be. But uh, we know what to do. Well, we go through, and uh, the Lord gives the increase. Send from heaven above, then 
Lovely. Well, as I said, there's, in this uh, account we had um, three sets of pairs. We've got the uh, two ways, and in those first couple of verses that we read, we've got the, the broad and the narrow way, and then we've got the two houses and the two trees, and that's the order I'm going to do it. That's not the order they come in the Bible, but that's the order I'm going to do it, just really quickly, uh, these three pairs. Two ways in those verses, 13 and 14, okay, and two, something else. What else? Two else. Were you, were you watching it when I read it? No, no. Two ways and two destinations in that first bit. Sorry, on the first bit first. Sorry. Two ways and two destinations. I'll read the verses to you. Verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. To, to end. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Two ways with two destinations. That's so easy for us to understand, isn't it? In life, there are two roads to walk on, okay? And we all start on the broad way. We're all on the broad way, going in the same direction, but that way leads to destruction. That's what Jesus said here very clearly, okay? But there is a narrow way, and there is a gate, uh, a narrow way that leads onto that path that leads to life. In John chapter 10, in our Bible, it's that Jesus said, I am the door. If you read the NIV, it says, I am the gate. So it fits really well, okay? There's a, a narrow gate that leads to life onto this narrow way. And Jesus is the doorway to that life, to that narrow way. Quick question for you as we go past it. Which path are you on? We've all been on the Broadway. I was born on the Broadway, okay? I've actually been to Broadway, New York, haven't I? Yeah? Massive, busy place. But we've all been to Broadway, in actual fact. All of us, because we're born there. And my nephew at Clifton, he's got a little four-week-old baby. And this is a hard thing. But what the Bible teaches, actually, we're all, they're all, even that four-week-old, is on the broad way. And we need to get off that broad way onto the narrow way that leads to life. And the way, according to John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the door. I'm the doorway that leads to life. Question for us all, which way are you on? What's your destination? Have you come in through the Lord Jesus Christ? Because he is the only entry point to the narrow way. Have you come to the Lord Jesus? Ask him to forgive you and change you and trust in him. And he says to us, come unto me, all you are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, and come on the narrow way. Well, that's the first one done. That only took about two minutes. Okay, that's not bad. We've only got three to do. The second one we're going to look at is, there's those two ways in this account. There's two houses. We sh maybe should have had the children sing in, um, the wise man built his house upon the rock, and all of that. Okay, I'm sure you know it. Okay, I know Really well. Two houses, but with two foundations. What were the two foundations? Make sure you're awake. Rock and sand. So two houses. Do you think the houses look the same or different? Well, it doesn't tell us. But what do you think? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Similar? Yeah. Different maybe? Well, they, in the end, they would have done, because one would have subsided, wouldn't it, and fallen, the one said, I agree with you. But I think initially, they look much the same. If you'd looked at them and say, well, that house looks, yeah, got front door, windows, just like your house. And here's the, here's the one on the sand, oh, front door, windows. Similar. 
But the, I agree with you, the cracks would have begun to appear, okay? Because they're built on very different foundations. Now in Bedford, Brick Hill is built on clay and it, you get this thing called clay heave. And all, you start getting cracks in your walls. It's all according to the foundations. I hope you're not built on clay here, because it, it does do that, okay? But these two houses, I think to start with, they look very similar. When you go to school, you guys, or work, I don't think on first look, you can't say, that person's a Christian, that person is not. On first look, probably not. They look very similar, aren't they? they got, you know, one head and two arms. Okay? They look the same. But the closer you get, perhaps, you can begin to see the cracks. I think, actually, eventually you can see. But to start with, not. Just on looking around, you couldn't pick the two. Okay? Like the Lord Jesus, when he was queuing up at the Jordan to be baptised by John, I don't think you'd have picked him out and said, he looks different, that must be the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't have a halo. Didn't have a glow about him like they show in the pictures. He became a man. Just looked the same. But here, these two houses, the story Jesus told, they got these two houses, but they got very different foundations and very different ends, okay? And the end, when the storm eventually comes and blows on the two houses, one is the, the co collapse and the fall is great, but the other one stands. And sometimes they look the same until trouble comes. And trouble comes all of our ways. It comes my way, it comes your way. That's life. It comes all our ways. And when trouble comes, <coughs> it shows up the cracks. Near Bedford, north of Bedford, there's what they call these wind tunnels where they test out, um, what sort of things they test out? Jet engines and that sort of stuff. And they put them, they blast them. And the force of, of these wind tunnels shows up the weaknesses. That's a bit like the storms in these, in these houses. Okay, the storms come, and by the way, they, we all know, they come to all of us at some point. Some storms are greater than others, maybe. But it's all subjective, and my little storm may be a howling gale to me. We all have storms. Now, the house on the rock stood firm, okay? It did not collapse. People sometimes ask me, why are you a Christian? Why am I a Christian? Okay. I, I think, well, it's the foundation of my whole life. Jesus Christ, the Saviour of the world, God come down, God, and then what he says, is what I rest my feet on in life. And things may be stormy around me, but I rest on that foundation that never fails me. Do you know, I need to be a Christian. 59 years old, had our measure of storms, we'll have more storms, just like everybody else. No different, just like everybody else. If I'm to survive in my family, if I'm to survive as a person, I need to know I'm on that good foundation. And the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, okay? Like you, I brought up my family as best I can. But I tell you what, I build my foundation for my family on that rock. The rock which is not something I fish out the air and make up, but it's got to be a good foundation. I need to know the basis to which I bring my family up, I live my life on is a solid foundation. A foundation that isn't something I've made up, because then it cannot stand, it's just shifting sand. It's got to be a foundation that's based on truth. Now, when it comes to the Bible, and I've had people ask me questions, I ask questions, it's good foundation. It is the truth. I have not found the Bible and the Lord to fail me. Not at all. It's a solid foundation. I'm dealing a lot with a guy at the moment and he's, 
He's making up a God and a, a spirituality of his own ma- imagination. Or, I think this, it's like this, and maybe it's like that, and maybe it, that's not a good foundation for life. Making it up as you go along, hoping for the best, and you know, sliding through life. No. Jesus said there's two houses. And the storms come, and the one that stands on the rock, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, is the only one that stands. You can say, well, I've got through life so far. Things have been okay. I've managed. But you know, maybe the biggest storm is still to come for all of us. The storm of death. I went to a funeral on Friday. A man, 81 I think he was, who in the last year of his life put his feet on this foundation, I believe. I can't look into his heart. So I, I'm not his judge. I don't say he is safe, he's not safe. But all the indications were, he said to me, Nick, I've prayed for the first time and I've sought forgiveness. He put his, and that storm of life, storm of death that comes in life, that's probably the biggest storm that we're all yet to face. Some of you have got had loved ones and you've seen it so near at hand that then it will come your way and you've got to face that storm. What are your feet standing on? What is your life facing, based on? Sand? I hope so. A bit, a bit, hope, hope, hope. Or solid foundation? You need a foundation for life, your family, everything you do, but you need that foundation in death. Because when that storm blasts through, it's colossal. And Jesus said in, uh, or the Lord said in uh, Psalm 23, through the psalmist, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You see? There's no one out there. Do you go alone through death? Your loved ones can't come with you? But the Lord said there, David feared no evil, for you are with me. It's a sure and solid foundation. And I don't just say this because it's something I think. I believe with all my heart that the Bible can be relied on. This is objective truth, that the Bible is true, that the Lord Jesus really did step into history 2,000 years ago, born, lived, died on a cross for sinners so that we could all come to him and was raised again. No one else has defeated death apart from him. Let's go to the last one. Okay, the last one is the two trees. And they come in the middle section, 15 to 20. He talks about two trees which produce two different sorts of fruit. Okay? Some good fruit, some bad fruit. That which produces bad fruit, that tree, in Jesus' parable, he said, well, that tree is not good for anything. Eventually, as it keeps producing bad fruit, we'll cut it down and plant another one. We didn't quite say that. He says, cut it down and cast it in the fire. It's no use. It's producing bad fruit all the time. If that's in your garden, away with it. You wouldn't have it in your garden, would you? Okay. How can you tell if you're a Christian or not? Okay. Whether you're a house built on the rock or the sand. How can you tell if you're on the broad way or the narrow way? Well, sometimes it's not easy. But here in the fruit, and as we talk about harvest, this is where we'll finish off and major, okay? It says in verse 20, you'll know them by their fruits. It says, thus you will recognise them by their fruits, by what they do in their life. So the question is, which way are you on? Which foundation are you on? Well, a test for us is here. What sort of fruit are you producing in your life? That's what Jesus said. Verse 20, you'll know them by their fruits. If your worst enemy were here, okay, you're you're all thinking of someone now, aren't they? They're not really your enemy, but okay. If your worst enemy were here, okay, and uh, say, Tell me honestly and write it down what you think of me, you might quake. 
If the person who's nearest to you, you might say your best friend or your husband or wife or your children, now you write honestly what you think of me, what would they say? Well, we all know we're all sinners. There's no exception to that. We're not perfect. Jesus is saying here, if a person's life is characterised by that pattern of behaviour, that bad, it's bad fruit, it characterises them, that's an indication that they're a bad, an unhealthy tree. They're not a Christian. By their fruits you'll know them. There's a really telling passage in Galatians chapter 5 about uh, lifestyles, which to me is quite a, a powerful passage. I'll, I'll just look it up and read it to you. Galatians chapter 5, where it talks about different lifestyles, okay? Let me read it to you. It, it doesn't talk about bad fruit or good fruit. It talks about works of the flesh and fruit of the spirit. Um, but I say, verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now the works of the flesh, so this is the unhealthy tree, the, the, are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, Sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. Now some of those things you think, oh, they're massive things. But when you look at things like rivalries, dissensions, fits of anger, jealousy, division, that is the bad fruit that comes from an unhealthy tree. Just to say, if you're feeling, oh, you're getting at me, this is where we all were, every single one of us, when we're on the broad way. That's the, sort of, that's the work that we do naturally, all right? That's what characterizes our life, naturally. It's not a complete list. You could say other things. You could talk about other habits that you find and things that enslave you. But then it, it, it goes on to say um, things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then there's a contrast. There's something different here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now the contrast <laughs> is colossal, isn't it? You know, that horrible, you know, an em envy, jealousies. I don't want to talk about the big things, but... Just the small things, as we grade them, jealousy and anger, fits of anger, that characterise our life, they, they're from an unhealthy tree. But then there is this other lifestyle, this other sort of fruit, love, joy and peace. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Gentleness, gentleness, kindness. Self-control. They're beautiful things. As it rightly says at the end, against such things, there's no law against this sort of stuff. This is beautiful in a person. And you know what? We all know it, don't we? We all see the two lists and think, wouldn't the world be better if we were all in that second group? Those beautiful things. If people were kind. If people were loving and gentle. People were self-controlled. Wouldn't it be a fantastic world if, if people lived like that? This is what heaven will be like, you know? This is what heaven will be like. 
But in the middle, as we conclude, Jesus asks this question. Um, I think it's verse, verse 16. This is what it says. Jesus says this to them. You will recognize them by their fruit, fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? You know, I said to you, what sort of corn is he planting? And you said, obviously corn to get corn. But from a thorn bush, you can't get anything but horrible stuff. Do you gather grapes from thorn bushes? Answer? No. Ever? Never. Because it is a thorn bush. It can't produce grapes. Grapes is what we want. But we're thorn bushes. By nature, we're on the broad way. We're thorn bushes. We cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit. So what's the point of trying? I am, and we excuse it, we say, well, it's just human nature. That's the problem. You're right. It is just human nature. My human nature. I'm not pointing any fingers. My human nature and your human nature. This is what we like. Can this thorn bush produce grapes? No, it's a thorn bush. Unless there is a miracle and a change of nature. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. There's no other way to change. It's a miracle. You, this thorn bush cannot produce grapes. It is not possible. I'm a thorn bush. I can't produce grapes until I was 10 years old. And the Lord Jesus Christ saved me. And I was born again. And at last, he, by his spirit within sight, to produce grapes. I'm still not all grapes. There's a battle going on still. But when I get to heaven, it will be all grapes. I'll be all changed. This thorn bush cannot produce grapes of itself. But this is the Christian message. You can be born again of the Spirit of God. And he will come and live within you and produce the fruit of the Spirit. And that's what salvation is. That's what the Christian message is. That the Lord Jesus came in, God stepped into history to change this thorn bush into something different. He lived his life and he only produced grapes. There was nothing untoward or questionable or doubtful or what's going on behind closed doors with Jesus. Nothing like that with him. His closest allies, the disciples who were with him for three years, and they weren't just meet up at eight o'clock and we'll go to work for eight hours. They, they were with him all the time, touring with him, staying with him, examined his life inside out. Judas Iscariot, who was his enemy, never came out and said, he did this and said that. Well, if he's his enemy, that's what he would have done. He'd have blown the whole thing wide open. He never could. They all said, John said, at the beginning of John's Gospel, he said, we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. All grapes, all good, because he was God the Son. And he came and lived like that perfectly. And still people hated him. That shows what thorn bushes we are. Full of jealousy, all consumed with anger against him. And then he hung on a cross for this thorn bush. This one who couldn't do good stuff. That I might be saved. And you might be saved. And there he paid for the rotten stuff I've done. This is the truth of the Bible. It's objective truth that God stepped into the history in Jesus, lived a perfect life. They all said so. Pilate, when he tried him those however many times, and Pilate was no friend of the Jews really, he, didn't, he was in the middle. But he says, I can't find anything wrong with this man. I can't. His enemies couldn't find fault with him. The Jews who began to hate him trumped up charges to get him crucified. 
He makes himself like God. He said he'll pull down the temple and build it again in three days. I mean, honestly, if, he, if Jesus was a blasphemer or a liar or a thief, they'd have said so. Straight out, they'd have said so. They were his enemies. They couldn't. Even the centurion at the cross, when he looked at Jesus die and said, truly, this is a righteous man. He's, put, he's producing just grapes. Just grapes. He's perfect. And then he died on the cross for all our sin, that we might be forgiven and be transformed. We might be born again. He might give us his spirit when we call on him. That we might at last produce what we ought to produce. What a saviour. And as the Bible says, the only saviour. The only saviour. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, as we, as we finish, the three stories, okay, the way, broad and narrow, the broad way ends in destruction. Jesus, the perfect son of God said, ends in destruction, judgment. The narrow way that we get onto through the Lord Jesus ends in life. Answer the question in your mind for me, please. Which way are you on? Have you answered it? You don't have to nod, but I want you all to answer that. Which way are you on? Remember, there's two ways, and they end in different places. It's like you come onto the narrow way through the Lord Jesus. Two houses. They may look a bit similar, but as the storm comes, the cracks begin to show. And one day there is a storm of death to come. Which foundation are you built on? The foundation which is of your own imagining, shifting sand, which is no foundation, or the foundation of Jesus Christ, the rock, the truth, who is the only saviour. The end of those two houses is very different. One stands, one falls. This must be important because the lights are flashing. Okay, uh, One stands and one falls. The ends are different. Now, this is the truth. This is what God says. It's not my, my love. How do you know? Well, what sort of fruit are you producing? To go to life, to go to heaven, you must be transformed and be born again from above. How, how does that happen? Do you see what sort of person we all are? Then you need to turn to him and say, Lord, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I see what my life characterises my life. It's not good. Forgive me. Come into me by your spirit and save me and change me. And you'll have a new life producing grapes, good things, and a heaven awaiting you. Come to him, the saviour of the world. Ask yourself the questions. If you've got questions, I'm happy to talk if you want. Um, we are going to sing again now, our last uh, hymn, Bountiful Harvest. But if you've got questions, ask me over dinner. I think we've got a, a nice dinner coming, so uh, look forward to that. And let's chat. Bountiful Harvest is our last hymn. Thank you, Will.
Have a seat, please. We're going to close in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. Thank you for that it is true. And Father, I pray that all of us might be basing our life on you, Lord Jesus, we pray. Bless us all. We need your blessing and pray you'd speak to us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Thank you.